like a remarkable and uh, <clears throat> important scientific theories and methods, which we call Raman effect. So in commemoration of his re remarkable invention, this National Science Day is observed as a mark of respect to him and his work. And every year we used to observe this National Science Day and the actual date is 28th of February. But this year, as 28 falls on Sunday, so it is not possible to organize an event program on, the, on that day. So we scheduled on 27th today to observe this National Science Day uh, celebration. Today, the theme for National Science Day 2021 is Future of future Science, of science technology, technology and Innovation, innovation. On, education. on Education. So every year, we used to have a different uh, theme for this National Science Day. And we are covering uh, a very wide arena of uh, science uh, and its impact. So today also we are going to uh, hear a very interesting uh, topic from two resource persons. Uh, the first one will be Madam Rosan Zolivarte, Department of Botany, and she is the assistant professor and uh, we are going to hear from her about this topic, the theme. And the second presenter will be uh, Dr. Lerem Ruata. He is the assistant professor in the Department of Zoology. And he will be presenting from ISOL. And he is the, our faculty member. And because of this COVID-19 pandemic, it is not possible a big gathering uh, to organize a big gathering at this uh, pandemic uh, situation. So this year we are scheduling in a different mode, which will be an online mode. We call it a webinar. So uh, even our one of our uh, resource person will be presenting from ISOL about 194 kilometers away from here. So. This is a very um, remarkable and um, memorable event where we are utilizing a modern information technology uh, gadgets to organize this kind of a uh, big and um, interesting uh, event. And I think this is the first time we organized a webinar for science, National Science Day celebration. Anyway, I will not take um, a long time. So uh, I will give time to Madam Rosan Zolivarte to present uh, her uh, presentations. So I will uh, hand over the time to our resource person, Madam Rosan Zolivarte. Once again, a very good morning to you all. I'm very happy to have an opportunity to present a paper on future of science, technology and innovation, impacts on education, skills and work. As our chairman already introduced, I am uh, Rosan Zwali Varte from the Department of Botany, Government of High College. And my topic is future of science, technology, and innovation impacts on education, skills, and work. I will go into my present. First of all, what is science? Whenever we talk about science, uh, the very first thing came to our mind is it is a practical activity. So science is the intellectual and practical activity including the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world 
through observation and experiment. Especially among the Amazon society, whenever we talk about science, the, the thing came to our mind is it is a practical activity. Okay. It is a practical activity, including the systematic study through observation and experiment. Okay. And another one is technology. Technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. Application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes is technology. And also the branch of knowledge dealing with engineering or applied sciences. Okay. It is also the branch of knowledge dealing with engineering or applied sciences. Machinery and equipment developed from the application of knowledge is also called technology. These are all the definitions of technology. Now we came to know what is science and technology. And we move on. Innovation. Innovation is a new method, idea, or product. And all. It is also um, creation, development, and implementation of a new product process or service with the aim of improving efficacy, effectiveness or competitive advantage. Innovation is a new idea, method or product, and an idea that has been transformed into practical reality. An idea that we had, a new idea or a new method that we had, if we transformed into, or that is transformed into practical reality is an innovation. Uh, in the field of a business, a product, process, or business concept or combinations that have been activated in the marketplace and produce new profits and growth for the organization. These are all uh, innovations. <clears throat> Back to innovations, uh, one of the simplest way to uh, categorize innovation is there are two types of innovation first is incremental innovation incremental innovation is an improvement in an existing thing already exists that is a product or the process or service and if there is an increment or improvement in the systems or a product uh, these are uh, incremental innovation and one uh, or another one is radical innovation radical innovation is uh, finding an entirely new way of doing something. Radical innovation is finding an entirely new way of doing something. Okay. Uh, I want to cite one example. Have you ever heard about Elon Musk? Yes. Elon Musk is the founder, CEO, and uh, chief engineer, uh, chief designer of SpaceX. What does the SpaceX uh, do? Uh, this SpaceX designs, man, uh, manufactures and launches advanced rockets and spacecraft, right? Uh, so uh, he had an innovate, great innovative mind uh, that is an idea or method then he transformed into practical reality. Then he is a uh, designer, a uh, chief designer of SpaceX, and they design uh, and manufactures and launches rockets, right? Uh, you might have seen uh, Elon Musk's satellites. Uh, yeah, these are all uh, under his, uh, because of his uh, great innovative minds that has transformed into practical reality. Uh, these are all incremental innovation is uh, in improvement in an existing thing. Okay? Uh, spacecraft and uh, rockets are all uh, uh, launches or uh, uh, these are all uh, succeeded uh, uh, at the long time back, 1970s and all. But this uh, space axis skills can be also defined as what makes us confident, 
skills makes us confident and independent in life and are essential for success. Okay. Skills makes us confident and independent in life and are essential for success. There are many types of skills that can help you succeed at all aspects of your life, whether it's work, even a sport or hobby. Two types of skills I'm going to highlight These are hard skills, also called technical skills. These are any skills relating to a specific task or situation. Hard skills are any skills relating to a specific task or situation and are related to one's personality. Okay, these are hard skills. It might be a football skill or a pro professional academic skill. These are all hard skills. And also the it might be reading, writing, these are all hard skills. Another one is soft skills. These are the traits, traits that make you a good employee and include interpersonal skills. It might be uh, etiquette, communication, and listening. These are all the uh, soft skills. Nowadays, hiring managers typically look for job candidates with soft skills. They usually look for uh, job candidates with soft skills because they make someone more successful in workplace. Okay. They make someone more successful in workplace. Uh, skills might take determination and practice. Skill might take determination and practice, but almost any skills can be learned and improved. Okay? Any skills can be learned and improved. Now we will talk about work. What is work? A task or task to be undertaken is called work. Okay? Or the activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result. Mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or result is work. The impact of technology and innovation on work, both in manufacturing and in communication has increased the rate of production. Impact of technology and innovation increase the rate of production and speed at which business occurs. Also, technology has helped workers, technology help workers to become more efficient and productive than ever before. This is because they are all uh, under uh, technological control. So there is no time lag or like that. They are more efficient. Workers are more efficient and productive than ever before. One key finding is that so far, recent technological change has a little effect on the aggregate number of jobs. Less effect on aggregate number of jobs, but leads to significant restructuring of jobs. Okay? Restructuring of jobs is very important. This is the uh, important effect of technology and innovation on the work. Through IoT, that is internetization of things, IoT, machines can simply talk to each other and react to any problem that arises. That is, it does not take any time longer. So uh, the problems arise can also be soon, uh, can be solved. And the enhancement in precision manufacturing by these smart technological systems lowers error rates. They lowers error rates and productive failures. 
overall reducing huge cost histor historically faced by manufacturers. Okay. In the field of manufacturing industry, technologies such as internetization of things, uh, data analytics, and artificial intelligence can complement skilled workers okay, under the impact of technological technology and innovation. Uh, they complement skilled workers in the manufacturing sectors and transform how factories are run. Technology and innovation can complement skilled workers in the manufacturing sector and transform how factories are run. Okay. Thank you. This is all my presentation. Any question from the audience? So thank you very much, Madam, for your uh, informative presentation. And I hope all the participants enjoy it and some knowledge in the recent development and the utilization of the scientific inventions. So thank you very much once again, produce myself. So I will introduce myself. I'm Dr. C. Dong Liana, head of department chemistry, government Champai College. And I'm the coordinator or convener of this celebration program of National Science Day 2020 here in government Champai College. And this program has been organized by Research Consultancy and Innovation Shale, government Champai College to uh, commemorate this marvelous discoveries by C.V. Raman, what we call the Raman effect, and uh, to celebrate this event. So now uh, I will give time to uh, Dr. Laram Ruata Haunar, assistant professor, Department of Zoology, Government and Pi College. In the beginning, I have already mentioned that he is going to present from ISO as it is a webinar program. So it will be very interesting. And Dr. Arun Watahaunar, he had joined the college in 2019, November, as an assistant professor under a RUSA scheme. So he is a very um, <clears throat> dynamic teacher with many publications in the reputed journals and experiences, uh, many uh, seminar programs as a resource person. And of course, the webinar program also he had uh, many experiences. So we are very much privileged to have him uh, as a resource person in our uh, program. And we are really eager to hear from him uh, the topic which we have today as a um, National Science Day celebration program. So I will invite him to uh, come in into our webinar site and give his presentation. Sir, please come in. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Okay, since Miss Sandy has covered most of the themes of uh, this year's National Science Day, so I will divert away from uh, the theme a little bit, and then instead I will talk a little bit on the advancement or uh, the advancement which has been done in science. And I will concentrate my talk on molecular biology since it is my specialization. So today the topic of my presentation will be the recent advances in molecular biology 
and specifically the CRISPR cas system, the magic of gene editing. Okay, so we all have a genome or DNA uh, is a simple name. We all have it in our cell and that genome can be altered using this gene editing techniques. So if you edit your genome or your mm -hmm. DNA, you could become a better person or uh, you could engineer uh, your genome in such a way that you could evade the infection of HIV or you could evade the, uh, you could, uh, you could be immune to uh, COVID-19 also. So those kind of editing system is done throughout most of the world these days. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is a hot topic. So I'll be presenting my, uh, uh, I'll be presenting the CRISPR-Cas system today. So what is this CRISPR-Cas system? There are different types of gene editing techniques, but this one CRISPR-Cas system is the newest and it is the cheapest as well as the most efficient way of editing a genome. So uh, CRISPR-Cas system, originally it is an immune system which is found in bacteria. And this CRISPR-Cas system, it is a way of fighting of the infection. So suppose this is a, your bacteria and these are your viruses. So these viruses, they used to infect bacteria and uh, once the infection starts, it causes the lysis of this bacterial cell. So to prevent that uh, infection of viruses, the CRISPR-Cas system is activated, which is found in bacteria. And this CRISPR-Cas system will destroy the invading uh, viral infections so that it could be healthy and reproduce. So uh, this CRISPR-Cas system consists of two components mainly the CRISPR array and the Cas protein. CRISPR array, it is a, a short form for cluster regularly in the space, short palindromic repeats. So this, you have a CRISPR array, which is found here. So this one is the CRISPR Cas system in the genome of a bacteria. So this CRISPR, uh, this is the CRISPR array, which is consists of uh, around 20 nucleotides repeats, or 20 nucleotides, which keeps on repeating. So this one is one of your repeats, another repeat, another repeat, and then another repeat. And they are being spaced by this uh, nucleotides, which is also around 20 nucleotides. And once this, uh, and once uh, these repeats are being transcribed or expressed, they produce RNAs. And these RNAs are the ones which we call CRISPR. And then there's another, uh, component called the Cas protein, which is encoded by these uh, Cas genes. These Cas genes will uh, express the uh, formation of the Cas protein. And so this Cas protein, along with this uh, CRISPR array, will bind to the infec uh, infectious viral DNA and the uh, attachment is made by the CRISPR array. So the CRISPR array or the CRISPR repeats are the ones that identify the viral infections so that this Cas protein encoded by the Cas genes can also bind to that viral DNA and cleaves it. Once the viral DNA are cleaves, then it is destroyed so that the infection does not occur. So this is the CRISPR-Cas system, which is found in bacteria. So uh, there has been work going on uh, from 1990 to 2010, trying to modify uh, the CRISPR-Cas system. So the, uh, starting from 2010, most of the scientists have started working on this CRISPR-Cas system and they uh, figured, out, uh, figured out a way or found a way to edit the human genome using the CRISPR-Cas system. So how they do it is that they, we know that these are the CRISPR arrays. They, the ones that recognize the foreign DNA. So what they did is they engineered the CRISPR array in such a way that it can recognize a certain gene, a certain gene in a genome, so that the Cas protein could act on that certain gene of interest. So uh, the CRISPR-Cas system has been engineered so that uh, be it uh, any gene, 
it can detect any gene. And once it detects the gene using the CRISPR array, then the Cas protein, probably the Cas9 protein, will act on that gene of interest and causes a double strand break. Uh, but because of the immune system, which is found in uh, the immune system found in uh, humans and other organisms, unlike the bacteria, we have this uh, DNA repair system called non-homologous end joining as well as homologous recombination uh, DNA repair. So these two types of repair will repair the double uh, strand break introduced by the Cas9 protein. So the genome will be uh, the genome will still be intact so that uh, so that the cell still survive. So uh, after that, the, with the induction of the double strand break, the non-homologous end joining uh, DNA repair will act on it and causes disruption of the particular gene of interest. So uh, crispr cas system is used as a way of deactivating uh, overactive genes or certain genes which are defective in our body could be made inactive so that we could function properly using the CRISPR class system uh, using this repair. Okay, so uh, in the case of cancer, we all know that uh, there are certain genes which are mutated and once they become mutated, they cause cancer. So uh, those genes are faulty genes and they could be replaced using this CRISPR-Cas system. So you have a CRISPR-Cas system which will recognize the uh, mutation or the mutated gene like in cancer and that mutated gene could be replaced using, uh, with, using the CRISPR-Cas system with a new template or new gene of the, uh, a new gene so that the cancer could be reversed. So that is how the CRISPR-Cas system works in gene editing. Uh, it has found so many uses in the field of uh, molecular biology as well as in the field of medicines. First, it is used for treating genetic diseases. It is used for treating diseases like cancer, AIDS, uh, muscular dystrophy, any other, uh, any genetic disease, diseases could be, even asthma also, they could be you, uh, CRISPR-Cas system could be used to cure these genetic uh, diseases. And another use is the reversal of antibiotic resistance. These days, even in Mizoram, there are so many cases. Uh, there are so many cases of antibiotic resistance because of the misuse of antibiotics. So uh, those kinds of problems leads to multi-drug resistant bacteria. And those multi-drug resistant bacteria could not be killed properly, even using different combinations of antibiotics. So CRISPR, that's where CRISPR cas system will come in and helps in the destruction of the bacteria which are res resistant to different antibiotics. And it could be also used in engineering, uh, genome engineering, where you could change the genome of a certain species such that uh, they uh, could be used for the betterment of mankind, like uh, wheat or rice, all these agricultural plants, they could be engineered in such a way that they become healthier and drug resistant and give more production. So those kind of stuff or things could be done using CRISPR. And another one is in molecular recording, where it is using molecular phylogeny. So today I'll be talking about the applications of CRISPR in cancer, antibiotic resistance, and in, geno and in genome engineering. So uh, first, let's talk about the role of CRISPR in cancer. In our, uh, every one of us have an immune system, and these days it's very popular with COVID-19. And this immune system consists of T cells and the B cells. And T cell activities are uh, T cell are the ones that kills a certain cells if it is uh, if it is infectious or if it doesn't function properly. So that is the job of a T cells. And tumor cells are not normal. Uh, they are not normal cells, so they have to be killed, and that can be done by T cells. But the T cell activities can uh, are inhibited by cancers or tumors 
through the binding of PD-1 receptors on a T cells. So you have the T cells, these are the T cells, and they have PD-1 receptors. And this PD-1 receptor, if it binds any ligand, then uh, the activity of the T cell will be inhibited. So the tumor cells, what they have done is that they produce a ligand called PDL1 ligand that can bind to the PD1 receptor. And this binding inactivates the T cell. So once the inactivation of T cell occurs, then the tumor cell will keep on dividing, le uh, leading to uh, tumor progression. So that is how the cancer cells evade the immune system. So even if uh, even in overactive immune system, the cancer cells or the tumor cells, they still survive. That is because of the inactivity of the T cells. So this is a very big problem in almost all forms of cancer. And that's where CRISPR comes in and it can be used to, uh, uh, can be used to kill the tumor cells. So uh, this is the first uh, CRISPR cas system work which has been done uh, and which uh, gives a, a great contribution to, uh, to science as well as in medicine and was done by Sue and others in 2016. And what these people have done is that they extracted, uh, they extracted T cells from uh, patients, cancer patients, and uh, they treated uh, those, uh, those T cells of the cancer patients with CRISPR-Cas9, uh, Cas9, and they remove the PD-1 receptor or they knock out the PD-1 receptor. So once they knock out the PD-1 receptor, then they uh, incubate the T cells, the engineered T cells with M14 cancer cell line. So these are the sarcoma cell line. And when they incubated the T cells with the M14 cancer cell line and did a propidium iodide assay, they found that apoptosis occurs in the uh, cancer cell lines or the M14 cancer cell lines. And they checked this using propidium iodide assay because once the cells are that they undergo apoptosis, the propidium iodide could enter the cell and uh, the dead cells, and those dead cells will be count using uh, facts uh, with the cell sorter. And they have found that uh, this one is the untreated one, and this one is the treated one. So when they have grown the engineered T cells with uh, the M14 cell line, it causes the death of the cancer, uh, cancer cell lines or the M14 cells, the untreated ones, they, uh, so the untreated ones doesn't die easily. So there's a significant, uh, there's a, a significant survival in the untreated ones. So this is how the CRISPR car system could work. And they not only that, what they have done is uh, uh, they had taken the tumors from the cancer patients and incubate the T cells with the tumors. And they have found that when they had grown those two cells together, it still results in apoptosis of the uh, gastric cancer cells or the tumors. So as you can see here, you can see the difference between the number of cells, as well as uh, number of cells, the untreated one or the control, as well as the treated one with the engineered T cell. So, CRISPR-Cas system could be used to remove the PD-1 receptor from the T cells, so that they could be used in, they could be used clinically to treat patients uh, and get rid of uh, their cancer. And so far, the technique had been in use in China, and they had treated 86 patients having different forms of cancer using this technique till date. Uh, and this, uh, so this is how a uh, CRISPR-Cas system could be used in treating cancer. And so this, uh, this PD-1 receptor, uh, this PD-1 receptor could be a viable target in our battle against cancer. And then uh, there was another work which has been done. And before that, uh, I would like to talk about the fusion oncogenes. Fusion oncogenes are the genes which is uh, found in exclusively in cancer cells. They are produced by the uh, fusion of true genes, uh, the coding sequences of true genes, which are involved in chromosomal rearrangement. So these fusion oncogenes are the pro product of or fusion of true genes. And the fusion genes 
fusion oncogenes are found in most of the cancers. So the uh, the and uh, so th they could be found in almost cancers. And if you can eliminate this fusion oncogenes, then you could cure cancer also. So this is how it works. And uh, uh, these people, uh, Martinez, Lake, and others, they, they have done their work in uh, uh, in last year, and they had published the paper uh, at the end of last year, where they targeted the fusion oncogene, EF fu uh, one fusion oncogene called EF fusion oncogene, which is uh, and uh, which is found in the cancer cell lines, even sarcoma. So they use the CRISPR Cas9 uh, Cas9 to target the EF fusion oncogene, and once they are being targeted, they had found that it results in selective or killing, selective killing or elimination of the cancer cells. So any cell, any cell which have the fusion oncogene will be eliminated by the CRISPR Cas9. So. Uh, and this is how the CRISPR system could be used. And what they have done experimentally is that once they targeted the uh, EF fusion oncogene, you could see that this one is the untreated one or the control, and this one is the one treated with CRISPR-Cas9. And once if you treat the, uh, give the CRISPR-Cas9 treatment, you could see that there is very less uh, cancer cell lines. And these are two different cancer cell lines. So you could see that there is a difference in the number of cells. And they use uh, uh, PEX or cell sorter to count the number of cells. And they have found that there is a significant difference between the number of cells in the uh, control as well as the treated one. So this shows that CRISPR could be a very useful, uh, very useful technique in uh, treating cancers. And they did a propedium iodide assay also and found that there is a uh, definite, uh, apop uh, or there is a very high apoptotic activity in, uh, activity in the uh, uh, ones uh, treated with uh, CRISPR Cas9. So uh, this work, since it is done only last year, right now uh, people are trying to use it clinically. And at the end of this year, maybe it could be used for treating cancer patients. So this is how CRISPR will help in fighting against genetic diseases. And next, uh, I just want to talk about how CRISPR could also be used alongside doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is an anti-cancer drug, and it is uh, it's uh, I want to say it's it can kill the cancer cells, but its side effect is a lot. So you have to be very careful in using doxorubicin, and that's where CRISPR-Cas9 could come because when you use the CRISPR-Cas9 along with an anti-cancer drugs doxorubicin, and, you, uh, and when they inject it into a mouse, they have found that the size of the tumor, which is found in the mouse, keeps on reducing. So this one is the one which is being uh, the one or the control which is being untreated with the CRISPR-Cas9. And the dotted ones are the ones which are being treated with the CRISPR-Cas9 as well as doxorubicin. So if you give this combination of treatment, there will be a significant reduction in the size of the tumors. So this is how uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system will be very useful in our battle against cancer. And uh, even here in this graph also, uh, the. Uh, my survive is very high compared to the uh, compared to the entry ones like the uh, like the entry ones. So this shows that uh, CRISPR Cas9 disruption of the uh, EF fusion, fusion oncogene along with doxorubicin could be useful in clinical uh, treatment. Uh, uh, now let's talk about the. CRISPR and genome uh, in its role in genome engineering. So as you can see, these are the two institutes which are found in the US, University of California, Berkeley, uh, this one is very famous. And then you have the Broad Institute, which is found in, also found in the US. And these two institutes are working on engineering or uh, tinkering with 
or I didn't, uh, or they are trying to change the genome of certain persons so that they could become a better person themselves. Like uh, if they have, if they want to become tall, or if they want to be uh, like some of the uh, forms or uh, behavior that they have. They, that they have, they could be, it could be changed using CRISPR. So these two institutes are working on that uh, field. And what they have done is that they use the homologous recombination repair that we have talked before, uh, yeah, homologous recombination repair to introduce certain gene or a full length gene so that they could be used in treating diseases and, uh, and in developing a better person. So uh, like, in, uh, as I said before, in the case of cancer, you, we have P53, P53 mutation, uh, which is found in almost all of the, uh, uh, all, almost all of the different forms of cancer. So if you want to replace the uh, mutant P53 with a new one, you could do it using this CRISPR technique using the homologous recombination. So, uh, but most of their work, since it is done in somatic cells, not most of their work is still unsuccessful, but they are still developing new techniques to uh, do this. Uh, but there was a, uh, there is a scientist in China. His name is He Jianqui. He had done it. He had engineered human genomes in such a way that the uh, two babies, which has been produced, uh, which has been. Uh, 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 which, uh, which were engineered, Nana and Lulu, he had done it and he engineered the, the genome so that they could be, so that they are immune to HIV infection. And he had done this work in 2017. It was very popular uh, three years back. Uh, so first to understand his work, we need to look at how HIV, cause, uh, HIV infected the uh, body, especially the immune cells, the, uh, T cells or the helper cells. So this is your HIV, the, uh, the virus. So this HIV virus has a glycoprotein called GP123, which bounds through the receptor called CD4 receptor on the T cells. So these CD4 receptors are found in T cells. They are called the help, helper T cells. So this is the one that recognizes the HIV glycoprotein. And this binding alone does not cause uh, the death of the uh, helper, helper T cells. It needs one of these core receptors and the dominant one or the most common one is the CCR5 core receptors. So this one is your CCR5 core receptor. With this true, recognizing the GP123 of the HIV, it can, this, this HIV will kill the helper T cells. That is why most of the uh, HIV positive people are immunodeficient and they can't, they, can't, they can't fight any infection. And then there is another receptor called uh, CXCR4. And this receptor is called receptor is very uncommon, but it is there in the human population. So what this uh, Chinese scientist, He Jianqui, had done uh, is that he, uh, he used CRISPR-Cas system to delete this CCR5 core receptor. So once he had uh, deleted this receptor in the embryos of the uh, couples that he uh, that uh, he invited, so he recruited uh, couples for an uh, experiment. So the father is the HIV positive and mother is HIV negative. And uh, he took out the embryo from the mother's womb. And then after that, he deleted the CCR5 core receptor. And uh, once the babies are born and become healthy, he, they, check, uh, they had found that if you delete this CCR5 core receptor, they found that uh, the babies are immune to HIV infection. So this is a very good way of uh, our battle against HIV. So much money has been poured into our fight against a HIV, but this technique technique could help in uh, the it could help in completely eradicating the HIV in our uh, HIV. So our fight against HIV could be over. So this is a very good technique, and he had done it. But uh, since he had done it on the embryo, 
And uh, since he had done it on the embryo, there were some problems uh, with the scientific community as well as the government. So I just want to talk about his biography. So I just want to say the sad and tragic story of He Jian Kui. He had done his PhD and PDF postdoctoral uh, fellowship in the US. And then he went back to China in 2012 as part of the government's Thousand Talents program. So his project was funded by the Chinese government and he had worked and he worked on that. Uh, uh, he had worked on that CRISPR cas system and trying to manipulate the embryo so that it could be, uh, so that the babies are immune to HIV. So, but other scientists called his work madness and demand stronger rules against uh, this kind of research. And he submitted his article and his work describing his study to Nature, uh, and Nature rejected it on the grounds that this is madness. So even though he had done good things for mankind, still his work is being rejected. And the Chinese investigation team found him guilty and sentenced to three years imprisonment. So uh, even though he has did, he achieved great things and probably could uh, probably should have got Nobel Prize, but instead he got imprisoned, uh, saying that he had broke some uh, broke ethical laws, and he is trying his best to help in medicine and mankind, but he stopped from completing his dream. So this is the kind of stuff which is happening right now. It is a bit like the days when Dolly came out using cloning. So hopefully within the next few years, this kind of work will be, uh, what to say, accepted so that it could be used in our fight against uh, diseases. And lastly, I want to talk about the CRISPR and its role in antibiotic resistance. CRISPR and its role in antibiotic resistance. Uh, so uh, uh, in normal situation, antibiotics are the ones which we take as uh, take orally, and they fight off against bacterial infections. This is how in a normal function. But once these bacteria obtain a resistance to the antibiotics, they could uh, none of the antibiotics would work anymore, and they could keep on infecting our body such that it can cause us death. So this is a very problematic situation, especially even uh, especially in our countries also. Uh, in the US alone, according to a report by Kiga et al. in 2023, they had estimated that uh, 23,000 deaths occurs every year because of uh, antibiotic resistance. And uh, more than 200, uh, more than, uh, more than uh, uh, around 2 million people are infected with uh, are infected with this antibiotic resistance causing illness, and they have predicted that by uh, 2050, superbugs could kill 10 million people in a year. So this is how grave the situation is. Even in Mizoram, also there is a big problem because you might have known about multi-drug resistant TB. Multi-drug resistant TB is now very common in Mizoram, also where two or three combinations of antibiotics will not work. So you need at least five or more combinations of antibiotics to treat the TB. So, uh, and most of the, most of this, uh, most of this multi-drug resistant TB patients, they used to die also. That is why we have to be very conscious about antibiotics and, and its use. Uh, but this is where CRISPR could also come in. Uh, so how does antibiotic resistance occur? So it could occur using the, uh, it occurs using a uh, multi-drug pump. This is the pump. There are certain pumps in bacteria that could pump out any antibiotics which enter the bacterial cells. So this is how one of the resistance occurs. Or it could occur using uh, plasmid, uh, using uh, plasmic resistant, uh, plasmic antibiotic resistant genes, which produce cell wall, which could modify the cell wall or uh, produce enzymes that could deactivate the, uh, that could deactivate the antibiotics. So there are so many ways that uh, antibiotic resistance could occur, but the most common one is the use of plasmids. These plasmids uh, are produced naturally 
uh, through mutation. And uh, because of the mutation that they gained, it causes a dramatic increase in antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So this is one of the biggest problem that we have right now, even in India also. Uh, so that's where CRISPR comes in. Uh, this is a work done by Golizadeh and others in uh, last year, at the beginning of last year, where they had used CRISPR-Cas9 system, CRISPR-Cas9 system to target the plasmid, uh, which confers antibiotic resistance. And once you destroy that plasmid, uh, that has the antibiotic resistance gene. It results in the destruction of plasmid because of CRISPR Cas9, Cas9, and that leads to sensitivity of bacteria to antibiotics. So you could use a combination of CRISPR Cas9 as well as the antibiotics to battle against the bacteria. So those multidrug resistant uh, TB could also be cured using CRISPR Cas9 and uh, uh, along with. Uh, and any antibiotics. Uh, this is a very good. Uh, and this is a very good findings by uh, Golizadeh and others. But there was a better one which came out at the end of last year, and it was done by Kiga and others, where they have shown that instead of using the Cas9 protein, they use a different Cas9 uh, Cas protein called Cas13A, and this Cas13A along with CRISPR is used to target any genes, be it the plasmid or the drug pumps, which is found in the genome, or any uh, genes, any genes which is found in bacteria that can lead to antibiotic resistance could be targeted using this CRISPR Cas13 uh, CRISPR system. The earlier one was res restricted to plasmids, but this one is uh, like this one can be used for any uh, genes, be it the plasmid or the genomes. And once they injected uh, this CRISPR Cas13A uh, into a greater wax mode larvae, and those which are being infected with E. coli and Staph aureus bacteria, they had found that this wax mode, instead of dying, they keep on surviving with the treatment of CRISPR Cas13A. So the CRISPR Cas13A uh, destroys the uh, destroy the bacteria, E. coli, and step areas so that the mold could survive. So this is a great finding. And the good thing about this CRISPR Cas13 A system is that it can kill the uh, bacteria without the use of antibiotics. So what this CRISPR Cas13 A does is that instead of just uh, instead of just cleaving the uh, and instead of just cleaving the uh, DNA, it destroys uh, or it degrades all the RNA. It degrades all the RNA, be it the mRNA, uh, be it the mRNA, tRNA, RNA, or any other small nuclear RNA also. It will degrade all the RNA in the uh, bacteria so that the bacteria don't survive. So you don't have to use, using this technique, you don't have to use the uh, antibiotics anymore. So this is a great finding, which is done by these people, Kiga et al. And this one is showing a very promising uh, future. So that uh, so uh, the projected uh, uh, projected number of deaths uh, that we have seen uh, before, the 20 million, could be evaded using this technique. Uh, so uh, this uh, CRISPR-Cas system is a very good, simple, and cheap technique, but it also has its drawbacks. Uh, the first one is efficiency. It is very efficient, but it is only around 90% efficient. So it is not 100% efficient. That is one of the drawbacks. And the other drawbacks is off-target effects. Uh, uh, even in our, in our genome, we have so many sequences of DNA, and this CRISPR-Cas system could target other, instead of uh, binding to a spe specific target, it could also bind to other DNA sequences. So that is called off-target effects. And that is why uh, sometimes, sometimes like one out of 10 off-target effects could occur also in this CRISPR-Cas system. And it, uh, the uh, uh, people who are working on it still has to 
or say uh, uh, redefine uh, or rework on the technique so that is very specific and doesn't have any side effects. And the uh, last one is ethical questions. This one is very important. Uh, this is the one that got the Chinese scientists into trouble. So uh, there are people who say that we should not tinker or we should not change, this, change the genome. Uh, but if it is for the betterment of mankind, I think we should do uh, this CRISPR Cas9 system so that people can survive longer and healthier also. So uh, before I finish, I just want to talk about what is going on in China because we know about the COVID-19 pandemic and we know that there are so many speculation that it is produced by China. As I have said before, most of the works that I have shown here, most of the works are being done by China and China has uh, I don't know, it has advanced so much that I think it may have surpassed the European Union as well as US in the field of science research. So uh, the SARS-CoV-2 could also be man-made. And if they can make the SARS-CoV-2, the one that causes COVID-19, they could also make genetically engineered humans. They have already made it. They have made the twins, which are gen genetically engineered humans. And there are some uh, questions that they could pr also produce super soldiers. So these are all, uh, I want to say, some of the talks which are going on in the scientific world. These Chinese, uh, Chinese scientists, uh, scientists, with the funding of the government, they could do so much that there has to be a strict regulations regarding the use of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, so no one knows what is going on in China right now with the uh, with the status of the CRISPR Cas9 system. So uh, I just want to end my talk by with this slide to use or not to use. People have been debating whether they should use a CRISPR Cas9 system or not. But the questions that we should be asking ourselves is not whether to use it or not, but at which level should we use it for the betterment of mankind? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, if there is no questions, thank you very much, sir, uh, for your okay, thank you, sir. presentation. Mm. Okay. So uh, we are going to uh, end up our program. So before we conclude, I'd like to invite Professor Tansangi uh, to propose a vote of thanks. And with that, we will uh, wind up our today's program. It is my pleasure to say that it has been a pleasant and an enlightening day. And we are very thankful that this program could be completed positively. And on that note, I want to thank the Almighty God for the success of this webinar. Today, I want to thank the co-organizers, Mizoram Science Technology and Innovative Council, Mystic, for the sponsorship, without which this would not have been possible. And also the principal for his support. We are very thankful to our two resource persons, Dr. Leren Matahangnar and Mrs. Rosan Zolivarte for their presentations and contributions to provide quality information to make this webinar and celebration of National Science Day an accomplishment. I also thank the organizing committee, the especially the technical experts contributions for the success of this webinar. Last but not the least, I want to thank all the participants, the students. Anyway, I thank you all for your time and patience. Happy National Science Day.